The stoical Stanley did not mention it, but to avoid a German gunboat, the Vidala's course was diverted via Halifax, Nova Scotia. There, equipped only with warm weather uniforms, the men endured a winter snowstorm. 600 of them suffered exposure. Five died, and frostbite necessitated more than 100 amputations. And it was quite a big stink on the island. If you look at the gleaner here, um, the dead and the maimed, and people are obviously horrified, um, it says here, we can't guess who were those who sent a 1,000 men from a hot tropical climate to a country of Arctic cold. Rest assured, this country's indignation has been fully conveyed um, by the colonial office. Stanley Stair survived the journey on the Vidala intact. He reached the Western Front in France in September 1916. There, the 3rd Battalion joined the support work for the fighting soldiers. The British West Indies Regimental Diary is different from that of regular combat troops. Here were men who joined up, thinking they were going to the front to fight for king and empire, and this can't have been what they were expecting. Here we are, 1916, 9th of September. Ammunition dump road repaired. Loading shells, about 6,000 handled. Next day, trenches for cables to heavy batteries dug out, shelled. Then, day and night working loading and unloading shells, 9,000 shells handled. Usual work, usual work, usual work. And this becomes a theme, usual work. Sharp frost at night. 300 men work all night in addition to day on clearing ammunition. Three killed, three wounded, two missing, presumed dead. And on and on it goes like this. It's drudgery, but it's dangerous drudgery. They were being killed while they were doing all yep. this yes. manual labor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, it was, it's, it's manual labor in the sense of you're humping artillery shells so they yeah. can then be loaded and fired. Yeah. You're digging support trenches, um, which troops are going to sit in. So people are trying to stop you doing that. Right. So, so they were being fired on so as they, they were, worked. That doesn't um, seem quite fair. Okay. Um, well, quite. I mean, would that make you feel different about your grandfather? They obviously didn't make him feel different. That's what no. I'm interested no, in. Well, he, he was easy with it. He was OK with it. And if he's OK with it, who am I not to be OK with it? <laughs> no, I'm fine. Although it may seem like menial, discriminatory work, it was essential to the war effort, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, there's, there's no doubt it was absolutely vital. They're, what are they humping? 3,000 shells moved. I don't think this is small. With our genealogy research, it's very hard to pull out the bad memories no. from mm. anyone. Even at his 100th birthday, when he would, was asked what was his greatest accomplishment, he always mentioned his service in the war. It was the highlight of his life. The work was certainly essential, but it couldn't have provided for those black soldiers what they hoped for, the chance to prove themselves equal on the field of battle. After the war, Stanley Stair returned home to Jamaica. He worked his way up to become overseer of a large plantation, and he raised 15 children. In retrospect, it's difficult for us to understand why the men of the British West Indies would have wanted to join up. Stanley Stair emerged unscathed and remarkably positive, but there's no doubt that his regiment was treated thoroughly shabbily from the beginning to the end of the war. They weren't allowed to fight for us, but they were allowed to die for us. In another part of the empire, much closer to home, support for the war was far from unanimous. Many Irish nationalists opposed Ireland's participation. But there were others who believed they could remain nationalists and support the empire's war at the same time. Tom Kettle was one such committed volunteer in the British Army. But when other nationalists in Dublin rose up against the British on Easter Monday, 1916, these two allegiances came into direct conflict. So why did he choose to fight for us?
It's often forgotten that in 1914, Ireland was part of the empire and troops from all over Ireland fought in the Great War. The contribution of those from the north has been better remembered, whilst that of those from the south has tended to be overlooked. World War I broke out at the height of the struggle for Irish home rule and was followed by Irish independence. So why were those men from what is now the Republic of Ireland fighting for the British Empire? Over 200,000 Irishmen fought in the Great War. When they fought, there was only one Ireland, albeit increasingly bitterly divided between the predominantly Protestant North and the Catholic South. In 1914, Tom Kettle was one of the most prominent nationalists in Dublin. A charismatic speaker, he campaigned for home rule. He wanted Ireland to be a self-governing dominion, like Canada and Australia. A barrister, writer, then an MP, by 1914, Tom had moved to an academic post at Dublin's new Catholic University. University College Dublin was a hothouse of young, Catholic, nationalist idealists. Many Dubliners expected Tom Kettle and his UCD set to be the next political establishment of an Ireland under home rule. Westminster passed a Home Rule Act in May 1914, but suspended it almost immediately with the outbreak of war in June. When Germany invaded Belgium, Tom sympathised with the plight of the Belgian people and what he called the small nations. He became a public advocate for the war. He wrote to the Daily News in September. This war is without parallel. Britain, France and Russia enter it purged from their past sins of domination. Let this war go forward on its own merits and its own strong justice. And Tom decided on the merits and the justice of the war, not just to write letters to the paper, but to join up. In 1915, Tom Kettle joined the British Army as a lieutenant in the 9th Royal Dublin Fusiliers and assumed duties recruiting men to his Catholic regiment. Tom was in barracks just outside of Dublin in April 1916, when radical nationalists launched the Easter Rising in the city. Determined to end British rule in Ireland, the rebels fought fierce street battles with British soldiers and the police. Tom's friend and brother-in-law, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, a pacifist, ventured out to prevent looters from ransacking shops. He was spotted by British Army troops, arrested and taken to Portobello Barracks. He was not charged with any offence or of having contributed to the Rising in any way. Yet, on the orders of British officer Captain Bowen Colthurst, he was executed here. Catholics in Ireland were outraged by the brutality of the British, and Tom Kettle found that his decision to become a soldier of empire had as good as branded him the enemy. Do you think he regretted his decision? No. No, I don't think he regretted it, but I think that in, in 1916 his world fell apart. Well, a few days after she Skeffington was, was murdered. Tom Kettle came up to Dublin and went to visit his sister-in-law's house to commiserate. There were two children there, Francis's son, Owen, and Tom's daughter, Betty. And this, after Francis's murder, the, uh, the, the, the soldier who had done it, uh, Bowen Coulter, sent a raiding party to the Sheehy Skeffington house in the hope of finding something incriminating so that he could say, look, I did the right thing. Sheehy Skeffington deserved to be shot. And they ransacked the 